There you should be go. able to hear me now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. How's it going? <laughs> Good. How are you guys? Cool, Great. Thanks. thanks. Lovely to awesome. finally see you face to face, sort of. Yeah, I'll just turn the light on. So, yeah. Oh, no, it's a, the monitor's a Samsung. Oh, cool. um, Quantum point thirty four inch, I think. And oh, cool. I've got the, the computer yes. body built for me. I'm a little bit of a tech geek. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sweet. It's epic. Yeah. So it's cool. Airplane mode active. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so you, whenever you read, you can, you can get that rolling if you like. Um, Did you go through the earthquakes and stuff when they happened? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What, what's the center yeah. of town like now? Because I was there like just after it happened and it was crazy how they closed off the streets. Oh. It's getting there, like slowly but surely where our city's coming back to us. Wow. And it's, it is cool because we've got something new and different. Um, yeah. And what happened, all the buildings fell down and they kind of exposed these like murals that had mm. been hidden wow. on the walls. So nice. it, Christchurch has become more of an artistic city through that because it's inspired the local artists. Wow. And now on all the new buildings, they're painting new murals as a distinct part of the city. So Ooh. I really love the aspect of it. Yeah. But, um, it's still a bit dead in some spots, but yeah. slowly coming to life. Wow. Yeah. yeah. They had to get pretty creative. And Kiwis are like that too. That yeah. Kiwi ingenuity will just like figure something out. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. Isn't that amazing? It's like that, it's that usual story, isn't it? Of like something bad can happen, right? And, and you just never know what kind of positive spin might happen down the track you know yeah and, uh, that's yeah. probably a prime example of that you know yeah something always comes of it yeah every tragedy yeah, yeah. big time yeah um well, i was going to ask you oh your surname is it hmm. is it tarawa or tarawa or um, maybe you could help me with that one uh it's tarawa, tarawa. so yeah okay. perfect Okay, I'll give it a go. <laughs> I don't that mess it up. Perfect. So yeah, if you that do that again, <laughs> okay, no pressure, bud. Right, no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> you know we're right. both watching and listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But just it's don't not worry, live. it's not live. <laughs> you chose, chose, chose two opposite places to live. Gold Coast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> With a <laughs> wire. Yeah. Oh, and Craig time, was time zone yeah. wise. I was the difficult one, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. How did you, how did you meet? So you used to work together? No, we, we met uh, in Ibiza together, actually. Yeah, we had like oh. friends and like... Partying yeah. in Ibiza. Yeah. 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 <laughs> As you do. It's always a good place to make friends. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, we are here with Lilia Taroa all the way in Christchurch, New Zealand. Welcome to our show, Lilia, and uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. We're really Good excited to, to chat to you. Thank you. Our, our show is obviously all about the full array of human experience and uh, yours is certainly one at the extreme end of that. And uh, we're really looking forward to getting into this one. Cool. So you were born into Gloria Vale, uh, a Christian fundamentalist community in, in New Zealand, uh, which was started and run by your grandfather. What was it like there in the early days? Well, I mean, you've called it a Christian fundamentalist community. And that's what it is. I, ref I do, though, refer to it as a cult mm -hmm. because it has those traits that cults typically have. Um, it started as a, my grandfather was a, a preacher, actually, and he would travel around Australia and New Zealand preaching the gospel of Christ. And churches loved him. He was charismatic. He had amazing personality. He was very practical with the way that he taught. Um, he was also a very proud man. And um, eventually that would always lead to him splitting from um, other church leaders' opinions. And there would be dissension. And that happened when he was over in Rangura. Uh, Christ, just out of Christchurch in New Zealand and he basically took half the church and set it up as its own community and the other half of the church um, stayed with the previous pastor so that was the roots of Gloria Vale and they started um, the people of the church started sharing everything like putting all their money in a communal pot and the idea of it was to create equality so there was no rich and poor, like get rid of poverty. And it actually did solve that problem. 
But then it slowly started progressing to more and more aspects that the church wanted to control and manage. And um, the family started living all together. So rather than in their separate homes, they would now live in communal complexes. Um, all the businesses were owned communally. The women started to not be allowed to dress um, the way that they wanted to. They had to wear a uniform and a headscarf. So it slowly started becoming, I guess, more controlling and um, more fundamentalist, more conservative. Um, women were not to wear pants, only dresses. There was a very, the, when I was born, and the way I was raised, I only ever wore like one type of uniform dress my whole life mm. and, and a headscarf my whole life. And I was raised believing that men, I, I was a servant to men or I was to be submissive to men, mm. that my opinion wasn't important in the realm of men. My role was to, in, in the home, to be domestic, to have children, to clean, to cook, to sew, to knit, to spin, and to be a help to the man. So that was the mindset I was raised up in. Mm. Um, I lived for all of my life up until I was about 18 in a one, one bedroom with my entire family. Mm. And I have not, I have nine siblings. Mm. There's two parents and nine siblings sharing one room with bunk beds was common mm. as the way I grew up. And I lived, if, you know, the room next door was my cousin's family living in exactly the same situation. Um, we all ate every meal at in the communal hall. And there were 500 people in our community. So it was this massive communal hall with six big, long, white tables. And we would sit there for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Hmm. And it was always noisy and people were chatting and there was lots of life and vitality. And my grandfather would preach on the microphone over the sound system. I went to school there too. So they had school on premise. There was a massive big kitchen also that churned out all the food. Uh, two big farms as well that um, the community purchased and then they moved to the West Coast and set up there. So that's where I spent most of my childhood on the West Coast. Um, yeah, that's, I guess, kind of a wow. big overview. So, so, yeah. so were you actually born into this? Like you were born in part of this community or did you guys enter it after you had been born? How, what sort of age were you? Yeah, I was born into it. Wow. So my grandfather founded it and my mother was raised in it from a child. So she was there from the very beginning. And then I was born into the new generation, which was the children who were actually born in the community and didn't know a life any different. Hmm. Wow. Okay. And, and so, so, I mean, cults generally sound like horrible places to be and i'm sure there's a lot of horrible things but some of the things you just explained there like the the big rooms where you ate together and um uh -huh. you, know, you heard your grandfather do the the preaching and stuff were, was there fun times as well yeah absolutely i mean i always i think i had one of the most fun adventurous childhoods ever i grew up on the west coast of new zealand on two massive farms with beautiful lakes and rivers and my cousins and I would go horseback riding and climb mountains and go eeling in the little creeks mm -hmm. through the pastures you know we would have like pet calves down on the farm mm -hmm. and little lambs and um that we would feed if say their mother had died or something had happened so like I'm a farm country girl through and through and I loved growing up that way I was climbing trees from when I was so young. Now as an adult, I think, man, as a parent, I would not let my children be climbing <laughs> those trees. But we just scampered up like they were nothing. They're huge, big West Coast trees. Wow. And cults and gangs, they have this thing that makes you feel like you belong. Like there's a really intense sense of belonging and connectedness and community and purpose. And it makes you very, very loyal to the community. And the people of the community of Gloria Vale, where I grew up, they weren't just people that I knew, like acquaintances or 
friends that I went, you know, to the same school as. They were my family. Mm. And we even called each other brother and sister. Like we saw them as family. And so it was, it's like one big, really close knit family that does everything together and everyone's got everyone's back and we all believe the same things. And yeah, we fight sometimes, but we figure it out and there's a certain structure and everyone knows their place. So I had lots of fun growing up in Gloria Vale, um, as well as the difficult things that came along too. But, um, I would say I really love my life in Glory about as a, as a child. Yeah. It sounds really idyllic actually, you know, like, like you say, you have that safety as a kid and you can, you can run around and uh, I mean, that's all the stuff that you kind of want. And, um, you know, speaking about structure, your, your mom was, um, sort of the head of the, all the domestic sort of affairs. Is that right? Like what, what did, mm -hmm. you know, she was, your family was obviously part of the sort of leadership, uh, at the church, obviously, and but what is what was her role there as well? Yeah, so both of my parents were leaders in the community, so all the business side of things, the what they would call the men's realm, would be run by a group of men called servants and shepherds. <laughs> and my father was a what was called a servant, so he was on the council or the board of directors for Gloria Vale. My mother ran the entire leaders' realm, so, uh, sorry, women's realm. So my mother ran the entire women's realm of Florida, domestic rosters, budgets, um, social things as well. So helping people sort out their disputes, um, setting up team leaders, mentoring, um, all of this sort of thing. Any events, community events, um, weddings, celebrations or festivals these were all run by my mum and she was the yeah she was the most one of the most revered women hmm. in the community and someone that I as a young girl growing up was like she was my role model of how to be as a woman in the world Wow, that's incredible. And so were you aware that like this was maybe a little bit different and that there were people that lived in other places? Or, uh, I like not kinda, part of a cult, you know what I mean? Yeah, but they, my mind had been taught a certain way of thinking by the leaders in the church doctrines and the ideologies of the society I grew up in. Uh, so I had this perception that there was this like world outside Gloria We called it the world and it was evil and full of sin and adultery and fornication and murder. And um, the people out there were lost and going to hell and that Gloria Vale was the sanctuary. So I believed in my heart that I was living in the safest place in the world, the one true church of God. And that's, I couldn't even think or want to be anywhere else. Like, so I had this perception that the outside world was this horrible, evil place and that I was living in paradise. Um, yeah. That's does crazy. that answer your question? Yeah, it does. So, so were they, were they like teaching you this in the church? They're like, this is the place to be and you know, outside is evil and it's like hell or what, what, what sort of indoctrination did they sort of give you and, and tell you about, you know, the outside world? Yeah, so I, as an adult now in reflection, I tell people that I was brainwashed and indoctrinated. And in a way, we all are brainwashed and indoctrinated by the media we consume, the books we read, the people who influence us. But in Gloria Vale, there's a very, there's a very focused, intentional way of teaching the children to bring them up in a certain way that they almost couldn't believe anything else um, or creatively think for themselves. You're not taught to think for yourself. You're taught to believe what the church tells you to believe. And you're taught that for you to think differently or question it means that you haven't got your heart right with God, hmm. which could result if God decided that he was going to come back and you being damned to an eternal life in hell a lake of fire and brimstone being tortured forever and ever. So there's this deep sense of fear 
created in children. And in me, I had a very deep sense of fear that if I was doing something wrong, it was going to be this terrible, terrible consequence. Mm. So it stops you from thinking for yourself or openly rebelling, or even if you see things that are wrong, you think, well, actually it's me that's Mm. wrong. I shouldn't be thinking this because this is a rebellious thought. So um, they use guilt to control what you think and how you perceive the world around you and interact with it and behave. Wow. It's really powerful that though, isn't it? Because, you know, God is always watching you kind of thing. So, you know, you can, even when you're alone in your own head, you are still being watched. I mean, how crazy is that? Yeah. Yeah. So you self monitor, right? Yeah. So a lot of the time the leaders don't have to do a lot of the, say, the work in terms of controlling their followers because they, the followers do it themselves because they're so, they've they're such an ingrained belief that if they don't, they'll go to hell. Then, yeah, and that if they do what they are supposed to do and follow all of the rules and live, you know, as a perfect Christian, then they will go to heaven. That's the reward system. Then... Like it's almost like there's not a choice. Yeah. Like what would like what would you do in that situation? Yeah. I would probably always choose heaven if that's sure. what I believed. Crikey, of course. Yeah. Wait a minute. And, Sorry, buddy. Go for no, it. you got man. No man. No, I was just gonna like ask what what sort of roles did people have within the community? I know we spoke about your your mom now, but what other you know what did like a a normal a person have to do you know you mentioned there were the servants and the shepherds but you know what, what did everyone you know have to do uh well the men did the work on the farms and the businesses etc the women did the work at home with the children the sewing the food um so they're very <clears throat> there were very polarized gender roles within glory vale which strangely enough functions really well because everything is taken care of. Everyone knows their place, knows their roles and works together to achieve the the result, which is a successful family life where everything's taken care of. Um, But in terms of like roles, if we delve more into like the family environment, um, I was taught that there was God who was the head of us all, and then the leaders who communicated directly with God, and then the the husbands and the men who were submitted to the leaders. Then wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as mm. unto the Lord. Um, and then children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. So that was the role of the family. And I would I would say that the husbands for the men, they're not really like husbands or what I would expect a husband to be now. They're more like breeders. Like they go out and they work and then they come home and they make babies. Mm -hmm. And they, Gloraval didn't practice any birth control, which is why I grew up in a massive family. Like 13 was normal for uh, uh, children in a family. My mum grew up in a family of 16 siblings. So she had, um, so we, we were taught and I was taught from a young age that birth control was murder and, um, that we would have all of the children God gave us. So the men and women were really, they were like the breeders. They're mm. there to make children, to care for them, to raise them up. And, and that's where they, how they valued themselves too. So for women, their value came in the form of how many children can I have? Hmm. How submissive can I be to my husband? Wow. How good of a wife am I to him? And to men, their value came in, um, am I working hard for my community? Am I contributing? Um, you know, is the work of my hands providing not just for my family, but for all the families in my community? Hmm. Really interesting. And- yeah. It all seems to work. I know it's it's not right or anything, but for some reason, uh, if everyone's been given a role and you stick to your role, whatever that role might be, you find purpose. And I suppose that works on some level, you know? Um, yeah. Whether that's... Really, yeah. 
Yeah, it's difficult because what is right, right and what is wrong? Like mm. the more you travel and the more you see the world, there almost is no right and wrong. There's just different. And um, the way that we live in Western society is different to how an, another culture lives. Um, and we've all got our problems. We all struggle with drugs and crime. And mm. uh, so it's very difficult for me to like stand back and judge Gloria Bell because there's so many things in Gloria Bell that I'm like, well, they've got it made in mm. comparison to Western society. Like they don't have a drug problem in Gloria Bell because they have no access to drugs. Mm. And statistically speaking, the marriages in Gloria Vale are more successful than in the Western world. People stay together for life. Yes, there are some separations because someone chooses to leave the church. But statistically speaking, the marriages are more successful. Um, there is, I believe, there's statistically there's less depression and anxiety in Gloria Vale um, because a lot of the things that often bring us stress in our lives are taken care of. Like you don't have to worry about money for a woman growing up in Gloria Vale. She wouldn't even ever think about money unless she was in a leadership role. All she would care about is doing her bit for the community, raising up her children, caring for the other children, supporting the other mothers, um, yeah, so it's yeah. interesting because uh, we, we've been speaking. Well, Craig and I always speak about these sort of things, and, and family structures actually changed a hell of a lot uh, in recent mm -hmm. times. And you know, back back in the day, it used to be a common thing that you had, you know, uh, lots of parents to look after all the kids because everyone lived together, yeah. and that's they reckon yeah. now, but might be like one of the contributions to high levels of stress and everything now, because people are mm -hmm. so secluded and you just have mm -hmm. you, your partner and then your kid and it's just you guys and you don't really have much support. So I guess yeah, mm -hmm. in, in a way there's, there's some good reasons for, for what they, they did in the cult. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah it's crazy. And, and when you mentioned making money, how, how did you make money? So Gloria Vale ran businesses, very successful businesses. My grandfather was an entrepreneur and um, like he would just teach himself stuff if he didn't know how to do it. Like if the car needed fixing, he would just figure out how to fix the car. So he was a jack of all trades and very good at a, at a, lot, of, a lot of them. Um, so Gloria Vale had a, they have a hunting business. So they hunt tar, chamois, red stag, goat, wild boar, ducks and geese. And hunters come over from across the ocean to visit this beautiful valley and hunt wildlife there. Hmm. And they have two massive farms on either side of the Holpuri River, dairy farms. So they're producing um, meat and dairy products as well. They have um, deer too. So they produce velvet from the antlers of deer, mm. which is a supplement, as well as venison. They have sheep. Mm. Um, they run a, like a composting or a meat meal factory where they take off, they reduce uh, skeletons and offcuts into offal, which is then used on farms mm -hmm. um, to sow, sow the land. They also used to run an airline company from it's called air west coast and it was going um to, to across new zealand um so there's lots of businesses they there's swamps over on the west coast too that produce sphagnum moss so that moss can be picked and then it is dried out um packed down and sent overseas and used to keep plants um moist especially in dry countries like saudi arabia or um america so yeah they that's how they make their money wow. very thrifty um and like there's a lot of ingenuity among the people of Florida. Val. jeez wow. <laughs> that's fascinating <laughs> and uh, lilia just before we move on from there a little bit you, you you mentioned like the babies and stuff you'd been around babies your whole life and you'd actually like actually cut the cord of a baby when you were really young. Like that must, you must be really like in tune with having home births and things like that. 
Yeah, I, I guess for me it was normal. Like I grew up watching big fat pregnant ladies walk around patting their bellies and you know it was so common for me to see a baby hanging off a woman's breast being fed and I grew up holding my cousin's babies and caring for them and my my dad had to travel a bit for business too so I stepped very quickly being one of the eldest in my family into a parent role for my younger siblings to support my mum who had a demanding job. So it was common for me to like change duty nappies or attend a home birth or um, knit, like they taught us to knit because I was being prepared to have a family of my own. So I was going to need to know all these skills. Um, I watched, I've watched six of my mum's children <laughs> being born as well. And yeah, at seven years old when my auntie had a baby, her first, I was there and cut the cord. So it was second nature to me and I guess because of how I was raised, motherhood and being nurturing is an ingrained part of who I am. Mm. Well, you certainly speak very wisely about the land and you know about family and stuff too. Um, were you in like a relationship yourself at all in the cult? You said you were being nurtured for and what was, uh, you know, what was the process around there? Was it like arranged marriages and things like that? We had arranged marriages and Gloria Vow. So all of the marriages were decided from by the leaders. Strangely enough, though, somehow it always was God's will. <laughs> that, that's the interesting thing. It was like, it was God's will, but it was written in a book by one of the leaders who God said that this person should be with this person. The marriages did need to be arranged. And the reason for that was because Gloria Vale did not allow their youth to marry outside of their church. So only the families within the church were available for men and women to marry each other. So in order to stop bloodlines from being crossed over too much, there had to, to be arranged marriages to make sure that didn't happen. Hmm. Um, and so I was not... I didn't. Oh, I did not enter into an arranged marriage before I left Glory Vale. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm like really happy about. But because um, it's like, I guess I escaped by the skin of my teeth, so yeah. to speak. Um, <laughs> because a lot of my cousins did, and for me, it was just the fact that there were some girls older than me that still needed to be arranged to have husbands. So it wasn't my turn yet. Mm. Wow. Mm. That's crazy. And like you said earlier, um, and that Gareth mentioned, you know, not everything is obviously hunky dory at, uh, in a cult. And, mm -hmm. uh, so when you were six, uh, you received a, re a report from one of your teachers and they said something to the effect that, um, you demonstrated some good sk leadership skills and, um, you were, you were quite a bright youngster and this was, you know, would have been a really proud moment for you or should have been, but what, you know, maybe you could tell us about what actually ended up uh, happening in that scenario. Yeah, so my, grand, my granddad didn't tend to like me very much growing up. <laughs> maybe something to do with the fact that I had a mind of my own. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I was, I guess I had natural born leadership abilities. But that doesn't suit the type of women that Gloria Vale likes to mould or that the, the society values. So I received, I was six years old, I remember I received a school report. They said I had these leadership skills which could be useful for when I was older. And my mum told me, this is an amazing report. Like she was so proud of me. What mum wouldn't be proud of her daughter for receiving such a great report at school? Mm. So part of one of the community's rituals was to take all the reports and read them out publicly to everybody. So then everyone would know who's done, who's done well and who's done not so well. Hmm. And I thought, I'm sorted. This is, I'm going to receive praise and adoration from my grandfather and all my peers and friends and family are going to think I'm great. And what actually happened is he read out this report and then he, he publicly said in front of everyone, we don't want women like you. Hmm. And I was in shock. I was so embarrassed. A six-year-old thinking, what have I done? 
And he said, well, you know, your, your brothers don't like you. You're bossy and independent. And really like shamed and humiliated me as a six year old in front of 500 people mm. at the dinner table. Mm. And I was, I thought that there was something wrong with me, that I'd done something wrong. And my aunt came to me afterwards and she said, she tried to comfort me. Mm. And I said, well, he's probably right. Like, this is probably just me. Because there, as I explained before, the way you think is that I've, you've done something wrong because you operate on a mindset based on guilt. So, um, yeah, I was kind of in shock from that and that molded my sense of who I was and as I was growing up in Floreval. Sure. Wow. Yeah, that must be tough, eh? When your granddad say that, especially in front of all those people. And... I think there was also a few other incidences which basically started started you know yourself questioning the the leadership of the the leaders in the cult, and one of those was your teenage crush, who was uh, beaten up uh, in front of you in front of a class. What actually happened there, and how did that impact you? So yeah, there are a couple of incidents which really stand out in my mind that I clearly remember as a child thinking this is not right and one of them was a boy I had a crush on in high school and um, he was dragged before the um, class while we were all sitting there quietly during a lesson and it was actually his father who was one of the leaders brought him in front of the class and I don't know <clears throat> what he had done but he was his father pulled out a leather belt and gave him a beating with it it made him pull down his pants in front of all of us. Mm. And at the time, like these leaders are the people that I, I thought were my role models, the people who were teaching me how to live my life, who were led of God. And I saw this man doing, treating a child this way. And I thought, how is that right? And that was like one really profound moment where I was like, it isn't right. And if the if the leader is doing something that is not right, then perhaps he is not so ordained of God as he tells us that he is. And then uh, there were other incidents too. Um, the the one that does really stand out to me is a young boy in um, my high, in high school who was playing soccer. He was cheeky. He was always making jokes and trying to make everyone laugh, and he had great banter. One of the school teachers and didn't like him so one day at soccer we were playing a game and he talked back to the teacher and so this teacher Nathaniel he started punching and kicking him mm. and I, we were, I was just so shocked like how can this be happening mm. and like no one stood up to Nathaniel or said this is wrong and I thought surely he'll be reprimanded he'll be stood down as a teacher like but he then the next day I remember he was back in our classroom I was like wow. how how is a man who treats who is abusing and beating a child allowed back in our classroom to wow. teach us like how am I supposed to feel safe around that kind of person wow. so I really started questioning the leadership and the authorities and how they were handling things if this was still happening and if it was still happening publicly, hmm. like, yeah. because it's not just in secret in a home, it's actually, we're going to do this as a, as a symbol of what will happen to you if you disobey. So to me, that was just shocking and appalling and not okay. Hmm. Wow. It must be really tough to, to witness. I mean, that wasn't just a, um, a symbolic, say, like um, caning, and he was actually physically abused, beaten, and uh, mm. yeah, that, that's pretty scary. Now, what what sort of things were kids and adults sort of punished for, and and how were adults punished? Uh, what were they punished for? Thinking a wrong thought. Wow! <laughs> like wearing sunglasses. What? Wow. So. You're not allowed to wear sunglasses in Gloryvale because they're worldly, um, mm. but wicked and evil. 
um, listening to music. So we, I wasn't allowed to listen to any music growing up unless it had been, had gone through the person who monitors all of that. The videos are all edited. So there's no free access to music or videos or like all of the information is controlled. We weren't allowed to read any books other than what was in the church library, which was carefully selected books. Um, so when I say I was brainwashed, I was brainwashed in the most extreme sense of the word, word because I had no information to make any decisions on except for what I thought or maybe my wow. intuition. Um, I didn't know about the world and how the world thought or what was going on in the world. Um, I didn't. I didn't even know there were really other belief systems. Like I knew there were, but to me, they were just sinners. They were all lumped into this category. And we never really, we never studied any other um, belief systems except to study them in a way that showed how terrible and wicked they were. Huh. Yeah, so information was very controlled. Wow, so no TV no magazines, no Wi-Fi, none of that sort of stuff? No, not at all. There was internet there, but it was only for business purposes. And it too was monitored. So like a lot of the sites were blocked um, and there would be a man who would go through and check what everyone's watching and listening to or downloading. So you wouldn't do anything that could be um, thought of as bad or wrong or disobedient because wow. um you would get in trouble that's crazy, that's crazy. Was uh, there, there, it, was, yeah sorry go ahead i was just gonna say you just say something for like what like watching the children be beaten or receive a bell team in front of the community like the physical side of abuse is it is hard like that's hard but i think what people don't understand is that psychological and emotional abuse is even more debilitating and takes longer to heal than a broken bone. Mm. So it's really about like the shame that someone feels by having their pants pulled down mm. in front of their peers and loved ones and being beaten for their behavior. Mm. So a, l a lot of the time, I think like even the cults that haven't been very physically abusive, there is this like overpowering emotional and psychological and spiritual abuse that happens within cults that those of us who have experienced take years and years to heal from. Mm. It's so, so scary. Jeez. Is there like a, a sort of like support system at all when, when that happens to somebody, you know, say it's like a, a friend of yours, a kid that gets beaten do like your kids get together afterwards or something? I don't know. Do you meet up in secret places during the day? Is that, does that ever occur? But not really. Like, because for most of us, like the same thing would happen to you huh. if you yeah. did. So like you don't publicly speak out about these things. Um, for me, like I had one friend who was my very best friend in the whole world that I confided everything in. Um, and, but she had come from outside Gloryville, so she wasn't born into it. So I could trust her because she was probably more rebellious than I was. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so like I would go to her and I'd say, this is terrible. Like, how could they do that? I'm sick of the way that they are treating these people. But there's not really anything that like I had no power to do anything in my society to make any changes. Um, yeah. That's sure. so scary. You know, what is always fascinating to me is um, how cults use, you, you mentioned it earlier, like you said, the sinners are fornicating and stuff and sex is always controlled. Like it's one of those things that's either used yeah. within a cult as a draw card, maybe they, you know, or yeah. it's like suppressed um, yeah. or used just, I find that really fascinating because it's always like a really bad sin. And, and I think it's, I mean, I wonder why that is. Maybe it's because it's, it's an expression of, of um, like what you want to do or, or something like that. Yeah. Or maybe just freedom in yeah. general. Cause like, you've got to think 
every aspect of someone's life is controlled. They don't have any personal life choices. All the life choices are made for them, even down to who you marry. Wow. So who you marry, who you have sex with, um, how many children you're allowed to have, what you're allowed to wear, what music you can listen to, what books you can read, what you're allowed to believe. So if you just think of like me as a child being a blank canvas <laughs> and whatever they wanted to paint, that's what goes in. So it's like I had no identity of my own. I was created by the church for the church to serve the church in the way that they needed. Um, and then coming out of it, leaving, separating myself, just suddenly going, I have no idea who I am wow. because I've never had a chance to construct an identity. Yeah. Cheap as I, mean, I mean, it's amazing actually that you even had thoughts that were rebellious in a way. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's so programmed into you that how do you even get that, that thought? You know, it's quite amazing, the human brain. But I, I was wondering, like, people must have been, when you're so suppressed, right, surely people are, like, meeting in secret or, you know, you, you must have, you still have urges, you still have anger, you still have emotions. And, you know, is that stuff, like, fully suppressed or just going on in secret or, like, did you ever see that sort of underbelly of it all? A lot of it. Um, so I did because I had two older siblings who did not like to be controlled and they were always in open rebellion and always being publicly shamed or like told off or told they were sinners so or punished. So I grew up having these two older siblings who were – in my mind, terrible role models for me because, <laughs> because they weren't the ideal of the society we lived in or the community we're a part of. But I think like you always get those people. You will always get those people who are like, ah, actually no one can tell me what to do and I'm going to do whatever I like, which eventually left to my older siblings, both when they were 15 years old, running away from Gloria Vale, and I woke up in the morning to empty top bunks and oh. I would never see them again as far as I knew Wow! because they couldn't stand it anymore. It's suffocating. It's too controlling and it's wow. claustrophobic. So um, in that regard, it's either open rebellion or quiet whisperings. And I think in every sort of every society we, you're going to encounter that, yeah. um, but a lot of it is, like I said, self-monitored and self-controlled. Oh, I shouldn't have this thought because I'm being rebellious. I'll go to hell. Oh my gosh, this is just me. This is the devil talking to me. So you do suppress all of that. And emotions too. Like I was never taught like what a healthy emotion was or how to process it. My grandfather hated women crying. So I don't really... I barely remember crying for most of my teenage years. There's a few few moments here and there that I had a breakdown and cried about something um, when my siblings left, mm. um, when I was trying to decide if I should leave. Um, but other than that, most of the time it was, I felt like a robot. Mm. Like I didn't really feel alive. And this is in reflection. And in hindsight, that I realized that I felt like that only because I'm <coughs> comparing it to what I feel now yeah. and my love for life and color and music and art and the things that make me feel vibrant and like I'm living in the world. Yeah. And I compare it to that and I'm like, well, I was dead inside. Mm. So was there no like color and stuff? Was it all just like, you know, browns and whites <laughs> and blacks? Is that what it was like? There was color, but it's more the way that you experience it because of we, who yeah. you are as an individual and what you allow yourself to like feel yeah. because like you're so trapped in your body. Like all your emotions are trapped inside. Like your creativity is trapped. Um, and there's certain ways you can get creative outlet, uh, outlets, like even just sewing and knitting and doing practical stuff 
that's very creative in itself. And for me, I still love it. Like I still love those practical daily activities. It's arts and textiles. Mm. Um, but there, there's like this cap on it, like that you keep like coming up against or a brick wall where you can't really let yourself go any further because you're so suppressed. Jeez. Hmm. I don't... And, and you mentioned your friend that came in from the outside. What age did she come, come in at and, and did she let you know what it was like in the outside? Yeah, I think she was 13 and she was um, from Chile. So she was also exotic to me. She had dark skin and there was no one in my community who had dark skin. There were three Māori families with tanned skin like I did, but no, no like people with really dark skin. And she spoke a few different languages, which I thought was incredible. So she was kind of like the portal to the outside world where I could taste some of what was going on on the outside and like experience it through her stories. She would tell me these stories about she would, she would go on an aeroplane and they would serve like alcohol on the aeroplane and her and her friend had a few drinks and got <laughs> off and they were a little bit tiddly. And in my head, I'm just like, wow, like, what would that feel like? What, what is this stuff that people drink that makes them feel so happy? And um, I didn't know what it was or understand it at all. She, and she would talk to me about wearing like pants, like she'd be like, oh yeah, I wore this leather jacket and pants once and like hitchhiked across um, America with my friends. And I'm just like, wow, like this life that she was telling me about was just so different to my reality and my long blue dress and headscarf living in one bedroom with my family and um, cleaning toilets. Wow. Jeepers, that's that's pretty amazing. And, and and what happened um, when your was it? You said your older siblings was it brothers, uh, brothers and sisters? Uh, who who actually left, and how did that ultimately impact you and your family? Well, it impacted. <laughs> it was heartbreaking. Mm. Um, I have to be really careful when I talk about them because them leaving was a part of my story, but I'm really sensitive to how like my siblings and sharing their names and their stories Mm. too. So most of what I've been okay to share with about my siblings leaving is in my book, um, which people can go to read if they want to find out about that. It was heartbreaking though. So I I will talk about my experience Mm. of it. Um, and my mother's because we were very close. So both of my siblings were 15 years old when they left. Um, So I was suddenly the eldest child in the family. And they, the church told us that we weren't allowed to keep any photos of them, Mm. that we had to burn them. We weren't allowed to include them in our prayers anymore either. So they were dead to us. Um, they were not family anymore. They'd chosen the world. They'd chosen sin over Christ. Um, and it was really difficult for us because for, for most of my life, I'd grew up in a broken family. Um, and the most difficult thing is that you can't grieve, that you can't process what has happened because you're taught how to think about it. So you can't even have these normal emotions that would like of grief and loss and pain and hurt that anyone would have. You think that if you have those emotions, uh, that there's something wrong with you, that you're just being rebellious and you're putting your family before God, which is a sin. Um, Yeah. So I guess, I stepped into the eldest child role very, very quickly, which I feel like I missed out on a lot of my childhood Mm -hmm. because I almost became a parent too quickly. Um, Although in saying that in Gloria Vale, like children, children are married at 16. Mm -hmm. Like it's the legal age in New Zealand and they want their children married as soon as possible. 
<laughs> so they can start breeding. So, um, yeah, I guess in terms of my siblings leaving, it was hurtful, but I also, I didn't process it until I had even come out until I was an adult oh. and I didn't even process like leaving Gloria Vale for six whole years. And that's a, so that's a really important piece in my book where I talk about the grieving process mm. and reconnecting with emotions, um, what that was like for me, because it can be like world shattering to experience an emotion like anger mm. when you haven't had emotions for a long time, it can be very overwhelming. Mm. And that's when my mental health started suffering as an adult too. So I, I, I do honestly think a lot of the processing around those things didn't happen until I was an adult. It's something that's just almost impossible to kind of imagine if you if you haven't been in that situation. It uh, sounds incredibly tough, Lilia. Um, you had other tough decisions to make too. You, um, you know, the, these kind of events kind of obviously pushed your family and yourself closer to, to actually leaving. Um, but there came a point where you kind of had to decide uh, whether, you, you know, to go with your parents and leave your cousins or stay with your cousins and leave your parents mm -hmm. how, how did you come to that decision and, and how did that feel oh it's confusing um I was 18 I, I didn't want to have to like choose between the people I loved no one should have to choose between the people they love because of a religious system or a belief system um I didn't want to leave I tell I tell my parents because I had a I had a and I had an inkling my parents wanted to leave. So I went directly to my mom. I said, if you leave, I'm not coming with you. Because at this point, I'd taken my commitment vow to the church. And I thought it for me to leave would, want, number one, be a sin. Um, but also, I didn't want to leave my cousins and everyone I'd grown up with, the life I'd known, the future that I had planned for me, where I would have a husband and children and a lifestyle provided for me mm -hmm. and a uh, a career, not really a career because women didn't have careers, but you know, a future, yeah. a purpose. So I think it was just time, like giving myself a lot of time to make a good decision rather than jumping in and going, this is the decision I've made. It's certain it's final. Mm. And one of the things in my life that I've taken forward is always giving myself a lot of time to make decisions because my beliefs change over time. And Beliefs don't change overnight. They take time and consistent, like you have to consistently find new information and inform yourself to make the best decision. And so for me, it was about what's important to me. Um, what do I really think about what's going on in Gloria Vale? And then there, there was a moment that was like the last straw. It was when my best friend, the girl who'd come from Chile came to me and she said, they've arranged me to marry a man from India and they're going to send me across the ocean with him. <laughs> and I can't do it. I don't love him. She was a mess. She was in tears. She was shaking. And I was trying to comfort my best friend. I was just like, don't worry. It'll be okay. We'll figure it all out. And I had no clue how we were going to figure this out. But I was just seeing this girl so upset about something that the leaders were telling her she had to do. And I was like, this isn't right. This is not okay. And so then she tried to leave Gloria Bell by running away and she was found and then taken before. They call it a men's meeting <laughs> where they get the servants and the shepherds, which is about 20 men, all seated in a room. And they put the person in that room, which can be for hours and hours on end. And they like, will emotionally abuse this person, tell them terrible things about themselves. You like manipulate them, interrogate them to the point where like this person is suffering the most extreme low self-esteem possible. And it's just at the end of themselves that they might say, yeah, do you know, whatever, fine, I'll stay just because it's the easiest option. Mm -hmm. So they did this to my friend and I, and after that I was just saw what stage she was in and she was 
so unhappy and sad and I was like I went to her and I said you you need to leave leave and I support you and it sort of in giving my friend permission I was saying to myself oh it's okay to leave actually mm -hmm. if things aren't right for you here you can choose what's best for you so she left and then I decided, yep, I'm going to leave with my family, went to my parents and said, I'll come with you. And then we all left, I think it was about a year, six months to a year after she left. Wow. I can imagine that. Wow. Getting back into, I guess, normal society and healing from the hurts must have been a, like a, just a massive journey and no doubt one that you're still going on. But what was that initial week like when, once you went out? To be honest, it was exciting, <laughs> which is probably not what some of my, but it was exciting. I was, I was leaving Gloryvale and I, I was just going with the flow. Like wherever my parents drove the car, I was going to. Mm -hmm. And it was just a matter of like taking a few of our possessions, throwing them in the car, getting on the road. My dad drove us to Akaroa, just out of Christchurch, where we stayed for a couple of weeks. To be honest, it's, all, it's a bit of a blur, a lot of it. Like I remember small things like opening the banana box where I'd kept my, the possessions that I had managed to bring. Hmm. And I remember like the toilet of the house we were living in. And I remember the views over the ocean um, that kind of made me feel like life wasn't so bad, even hmm. though I'd had left everything I'd ever known. Um, yeah. So it was just like settling into like, how do I live in this world? How do I use an F post card? What is a bank account? How does that function? How do I dress myself? Like, I didn't know these things. I, is it okay for me to wear a headscarf? Like, or, a, sorry, is it okay for me to not wear a headscarf? Mm -hmm. Am I allowed to wear makeup? Is jewelry okay? Like, how do I have to cover my whole body? Or can I wear short dresses or tight pants? Or So there were all these things that I had to figure out and I didn't know. And, it was, it was honestly just trial and error. Wow. So much stuff that we, we do in our lives uh, in a, let's say in a normal society, let's, mm -hmm. let's say um, that you don't even, like you say, don't even think about it. Like you just wake up and you put on your clothes and you, you've got your fashion that you sort of, you, you know, mm -hmm. aspire to. And uh, you, you know, all these little things like the F pass card, it must be really confusing and exciting, I suppose, like you said, mm -hmm. but, I guess it wasn't uh, all easy as well. Like you had at some stage had some attacks, panic attacks and some remorse about leaving, I would imagine. And, and you know, what, if you did have some remorse, was it because you're missing family back in the cult? I never regretted leaving Glory Vale. Once mm. my decision was made, it was made. And I knew why I was making that decision. And I took about two years to make that decision. Mm. So by that time, I was guaranteed this is the right thing. I never wanted to go back. It was just painful because mm. I missed my cousins so much. And I haven't seen them for 10 years. And I still miss them every single day. Um, I think the panic attacks really came when I, six years after I left Gloria Bell, and I was facing my demons head on. By this time, I'd sort of settled into normal life. I'd attended college. I'd traveled a bit. I had gotten my first job. I then moved into running a company. So there was, I, I had my life. It was functioning and flowing along nicely. And then I was like, okay, I better process this backlog of trauma that I've got. Mm. And I wanted to, I wanted to know about it. I was still very confused about Gloria about How should I think about it? How should I feel about it? It was always on the news and every time it was on the news, I felt horrible and sad and upset. And I would watch the documentaries of Gloria Val on my laptop in my bedroom, just crying, trying to understand it or process it. And it was so close to home. And in doing this, like I got a bit overwhelmed and also stressed running a business, trying to process this emotion. I started to write as well. And yeah, I was experiencing a lot of anxiety and these panic attacks that I didn't know where they were coming from or why I was having them. 
And I made a decision that I needed to like figure it out. So um, I started taking care of myself and immersing myself in things that made me happy. Um, so I started to use meditation as a technique just to calm my mind and create some space and ease in my body. And I started using, using yoga as a means to like stay healthy and fit, but also to relax and calm down. And they, it worked amazingly. Mm-hmm. I was finding more in a piece. And then I started writing just whatever came to my mind to get it out of me because I felt like I had so much pent up emotion that I needed to express it some way. So I did it with words because that was like the first thing that came to mind and also music. My friend um, who was now living on the outside gifted me a beautiful guitar for my, um, for my birthday and I would pick that up and just use that as a place to get away Mm. and play music and sing and that still is one of my happy places it's part of my daily routine that I music is an important part of my life and my healing and so that's kind of how I like climbed out of this terrible pit of despair I was in and sort of really started like collecting pieces of my identity back to me, Mm. reconnecting with my Māori heritage as well, which hadn't been, I wasn't allowed to growing up because, Mm. I mean, that would have been a part of my identity. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, Yeah, very much so, yeah. So so just so I, I understand, this cult is actually still going on, is it? Yeah, it's still functioning over on the west coast of New Zealand. Wow. And, and so, I mean, it, it almost, it seems like, I don't know, the, the integration must have been more difficult than, than maybe what you just said now. Like, surely, like meeting people, telling them uh, who you are, you know, where you've come from, um, just learning new things about things, it, it must have been, that must have been difficult. I mean, some of it kind of all been exciting, I guess. Yeah, well you've got to remember I was really naive. So I would just rock up to people and like, I didn't have the social expectations imposed on me Mm. that I do now living in this society. So I would just rock up to people and be like, Oh yeah, I grew up in Gloriavale. Like, hi, my name's Lilia. What's your name? Mm -hmm. Like I had, I didn't have (laughs) any reservations, so to speak. And they only came later when they started experiencing the prejudice that people had towards Gloriavale. So I only started to feel like that I couldn't be myself when I was suddenly watching these news programs that people were talking about my home in such horrible ways. And I was like, what did I, did I really grow up that terribly? Hmm. Um, and then I was like, well, now I can't tell people I'm from Gloriavale because they'll judge me and they'll um, think that I'm a weirdo or that I came from a funny farm. Hmm. So I didn't feel like I now fit in and belonged but my naivety actually allowed me to make lots of friends first and foremost. And it wasn't until after that the insecurity cropped up because of what the media was saying and people's mm. preconceived notions about Gloriavale and just watching some people's reactions. And I'm, I say some people, cause some people are like, wow, what an amazing story. Well done on you for leaving. Like that's incredible. Tell me more where other people are like, that's so weird. That place is horrible. Like, mm how could you ever live there? Like, why would someone even want to join it? The place should be burnt to the ground. Wow. So there, were, there was all this, like, that I had to kind of process and go, well, actually, this is my home, and the people you're saying should, their homes should be burnt to the ground, and my cousins, like Anna mm. and Hope, that I grew up with, so, like, don't talk about my family like that. Yeah. And then on the other hand, I'm like, well, maybe I am weird. Like, look, the, the, we're the only ones living or Glory about the only ones in New Zealand who live like that. So why are they so different? Mm. So that was very confusing as a young adult. So mm. most of the time I just put it aside and was just like, I'm just going to like go on road trips with my friends and yeah. concentrate on my art or my creativity. Cause I don't even know how to process that. I don't have the wisdom or like, I don't know. I was so confused. <laughs> And can you tell us more about your, your writing and your meditation and yoga? Like, 
had you kept a diary or, you know, what, where had you sort of got this writing from and, and also the meditation, like how, how did you come across this stuff? And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, maybe tell us a little bit more about the journey of, of the actual nitty gritty of the, in the ways that you got through this. Yeah. Um, I actually, I was running my parents' business for them and I started to get into business development and I was reading books like Start With Why by Simon Sinek and Awaken the Giant Within by Tony Robbins. And I was reading these books for the purpose of number one, self-development and growth, but also like developing my business too. But in all of those books, there is a common theme of like personal responsibility and starting at the heart of the issue. And um, that's when I started doing some goal setting and write, writing down what I wanted in life. And, um, and then I started getting into um, relationships as well. So I was in the dating scene outside Gloryville, which I had no idea how yeah. this dating scene works. Like I grew up with arranged marriages. So I had to figure all of this out. And like, I didn't know. So one of my boyfriends introduced me to a bit of personal development and I started reading more books. Um, so I started reading Brene Brown and I was also reading a lot of fiction um, as well. That was very different to what I was allowed to read in Gloria Vale. Um, and then another friend of mine introduced me to yoga, took me along to a class and I was like, this is different, but I kind of yeah. like it. it. makes me feel good. So all good. I'll give it a go. Um, and it was just a matter of like the people that I met throughout my life introducing me to these aspects of personal development. And then I just loved it. Like I got further and further into it, um, into healing. Um, my health had started to suffer because of the emotional stress I was experiencing. And so I started looking into the holistic health industry and understanding how to care for my body and feed it well. All these things that I'd not ever been taught. So I was just like, I'm going to self-educate myself because that's the only option. That's how I kind of rolled into this lifestyle of valuing health, valuing personal growth, developing myself mentally, um, doing what I love for a living, um, chasing my dreams, following my heart, having a grounded sense of who I am and a connection to my identity, um, being a role model for other people who have lived in similar situations to me and creating a business from my creative work. For me, writing is creativity. And I thought, well, what better story to write than my own? Because mm -hmm. in, in a way, it was for me personal therapy. So I wrote my book for myself first and foremost and to help other people too. And then what, what has been the result of writing that book for you? Uh, it's opened up a lot more areas. I've honestly, I feel more alive, which is both beautiful and horrible because I feel pain so much more deeply than I ever have. But at the same time, I feel joy so much more deeply. And I've really found a sense of who I am. Um, I remember during my book launch, I was in Auckland for it. And I was standing in my hotel room looking over the city. And I realized in that moment, I thought I could die right now and I would be okay with it. Wow. And I'd always had this like fear of death because death for me meant I would go to hell or heaven. Hmm. And I felt like I've written my book. I've done something for the world. This is me fulfilling my purpose. If I die, I can die a happy woman. It wouldn't bother me. Wow. So that was a really eye-opening personal moment where I knew this is my path. This is what I was born to do. And this is the message that I was born to share with people, um, that you can live a life you love. You can find, you know, change your beliefs. You don't have to live in suppression um, and you can heal. Healing's possible no matter what you've been through because I've been through some horrible experiences in my life, but here I am. Mm. So I just wanted to give others hope. Do, do, do you ever 
um, feel like, you know, you might, you know, these, let's say harking back to the days of when you were obviously very deeply religious, do you ever yeah. have guilt or these flashes of like, I might burn in hellfire, you know, these kind of thoughts ever, like, because they were so indoctrinated mm. in you. It's not mm. like they're just gone, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. Like I made peace with my decision to leave before I left. So I made the decision. Once the decision was made, I was on that path. So what I would say I have never looked back. Like I've never felt like guilty. Um, I have felt more curious mm. about what I don't know because I've come from this time, this world where my world was so tiny. And then I stepped outside and there was suddenly sunlight and rainbows and birds and trees and people and all these things that I never knew existed. And I, for me, I've just wanted to learn and learn and learn more about that. Um, when I left Glory Vale, I attended church straight away. So I remained a Christian. Uh. I, but I never felt guilty for leaving. I knew it was the right thing to do. Then I came to the decision that I wanted to leave churches out here as well. I wanted to leave Christianity. That was a tough decision, but also a sort of a natural flow for me. I was worried. And the main thing I was worried about is that my friends that I'd made in the churches out here would disown me because that was the experience that I had had. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, happily, the people in churches out here were more liberal and they said, look, no matter what you choose, we'll still be your friends and we'll still love you. And so for me, that was very empowering. And um, I left Christianity altogether and just started to explore the world in my own right, asking myself, like, what do I believe? Does it, does it matter mm. what I believe? Um, what other belief systems are there out there that I could learn about and maybe want to, like, garner pieces from that would suit me and suit who I am? And, like, how do I want to construct my own belief system? So I would say my curiosity has always been, since leaving, greater than my guilt mm. fair enough and you you speak about uh belief systems and and stuff like that so is there something you tell yourself say at the start of each day like do you have any sort of affirmations that you do to you know to set your day up to help with self-belief and that yeah um sorry i'll just do this um so in terms of affirmations, like uh, they're a huge part of my life. So learning to manage my inner voice has been one of the most powerful tools that I've learned because it's very easy having come from glory of our to slip back into that mindset of like, I'm not doing good enough. I'm not a good enough partner. I'm failing at my business. And so for me, I use this very simple technique or I just take those limiting beliefs about myself that don't serve me. And I just give myself the opposite belief and write that down. And that's my affirmation for the day. So it mm. depends on what I'm struggling with. If I'm feeling like I'm a really crap partner to my boyfriend today, I'll just write down this belief. I'm a caring and loving partner. Or if I'm thinking I'm not doing a good enough job in my business, I'll write an affirmation that says I'm doing a really good job in my business. And that immediately shifts me into this mindset of being inspired, being able to be creative, mm -hmm. having no limits and giving myself permission to live the life I want to live instead of being stuck in a mindset that inhibits and prohibits me from pursuing my dreams. I love it. Yeah. Wow. And so, so can you, um, what, what is your business now that you run? Um, can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I'm a writer, so I've written my first book, wow. um, which was a memoir, and it was a number one bestseller, which I'm super happy about. Mm -hmm. nice. um, wasn't expecting that. Also, I'm a speaker too, so a keynote speaker. So I go and I share my story at people's conferences, their business awards, um, teach at workshops. So that's a part of my business. 
And then um, I run a course, which is an online course for creative people who want to monetize their passions and monetize their creative gifts and live a life they love. So I've learned all these things along the way and I've garnered so much experience that I thought, well, if I can package that into something that actually helps people, then I'm doing a greater service because there were so many people coming to me saying, can you teach me about this? Can you teach me how to deal with anxiety? Can you teach me how to like create a business from my dream? Um, and I was like, I'm not, I have nothing that I can help these people with truly. So I thought I need to create a course. And that was why I did that. And um, yeah, I will definitely planning to write more too. Like writing will always be a part of who I am. And I'd, l I'd love to write young adult fiction um nice. sci-fi and fantasy i am obsessed with it's my favorite genre so i i am planning to write in that genre too wow i'm sure you can help people a lot with self-belief self-worth self-love uh which yeah. which you know you totally went through yourself struggling with that and and i guess you you know even if you want to start a, a course or something those are the foundational things that you kind of mm. need to have and then you can really help people through that. Um, I had a bit of a left field question. Had you ever read, uh, you've obviously read so many people's work and um, you know, I met, you mentioned Sam Harris, Demartini, uh, mm -hmm. Sinek, which are all really interesting people, but have you read someone uh, whose her name is Teal Swan? Yeah. Oh yeah. Cause she yeah. was also, she also went through sort of a harrowing cult kind of an experience. Mm. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I am um, connected with her work on YouTube. So uh, that's where I've consumed her work. Yeah, but she is a very, I guess there's lots of similarities between the types of environments that we grow up in. Because yeah. cults do seem to have a similar thread that run through them all. Yeah, it's just really interesting. Yeah, and it's, uh, um, I mean, both of you have got great stories and you've both come through in, in real positive ways. So it's just really mm -hmm. inspiring to see that. And there was also a lady, uh, Heather Welsh. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her. Um, there, there was a movie on Netflix, the something of uh, Mangatiti, or I can't remember the exact <laughs> title of it. Um, but okay. no, she was she was held up uh, in New Zealand, like for I don't know a long time, like many many years, by this guy. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, she recently shared her story too within the last sort of five years and sort of escaped mm -hmm. and stuff. And yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's really, really scary. These sort of things that go on. Um, have you, as a result of your book, had anyone say like Netflix, K, okay, you know, can we do a movie on you or anything like that? Yeah. So there's been lots of interest. So it's just about like, who's the right person to do it and do I want to do it mm. and how should it be done? Um, so yeah, that's definitely a possibility um, with my story is that it could be told in video form. Um, yeah. So we'll, I guess we'll see how that happens. I haven't, um, you might've heard of the handmaid's tale, right? Mm. I haven't been able to bring myself to watch that yet. Mm. Just it's, it's just too close to home and there's too many things where I'm just like, Oh, that makes me feel so sick. Wow. Um, but the costumes for the handmaid's tale, the costume designer actually used Gloria Vale's outfits as an inspiration hmm. for her costume design, wow. which is really interesting. Wow. Very um, close to home. Yeah. And, and, and what, what like excites you, you know, the most about now and about the future? But, um, t to be honest, it's like that I can be creative is the most exciting thing for me. It's the thing that makes me happy the most, like that I can read more, whatever books I want is the most exciting thing to me. And just on holiday, like I downloaded the first of the Witcher books, which is like Blood of Elves. Okay, um, yeah. So that's, you might have heard of it. It's like from a, it's a game, it's a game, a video game. But I was just like, wow, I can just download this book and read it. I don't have to ask someone if I can read it or like think that I'm not allowed to. Like I can just pursue it. Like, so I have this like sense of freedom, which is like, if I want to walk into the next room, pick up my guitar and sing whatever I want, I can do that. 
And if I want to go traveling the world, and that's the life that I want to live, I can do that. So it's this sense of freedom and possibility that whatever I want to do, I can choose it. And just having the choice is the most exciting thing. Wow, that's beautiful. And what are your plans um, specifically going forward for a book and that kind of thing? What have you got planned for the coming weeks and months and years? So this next year will be all about my course and I'll be working a lot on that and writing on the side as well. I don't have any dates when I'm going to publish uh, my fictional writing and I want to give myself time to really develop that. Um, but it's definitely something that I'll, a project I'll be working on in the background. Um, and I'll be continuing to speak when people ask me to speak at their events. I'll be doing that as well. Yeah. So that's my, those are my plans. And who is your course uh, mostly geared towards? What sort of niche have you chosen? It's creative people who have an important message to share. So writers, speakers, coaches, artists, people who um, really, yeah, have this sense of like, I'm a highly creative person, but at the same time, I have such an important message to share and I don't know how to get it out there. So for me, it's about like helping them create time in their lives to be creative, spend more time with family, how to build a business and the skills of how to self-promote and market yourself and and get people to buy your work and how do you price yourself. There's all these Mm. topics that people learn within my course that just help them to do that. that, That's super relevant right now you know especially with with all these people starting their online businesses and mm-hmm. and going from like the corporate world into online businesses and thinking it's going to yeah. be a smooth ride and it's probably yeah. the complete opposite so yeah imagine you're going to be helping lots of people along the way mm. yeah so so one of the um yeah well before we ask you our last question actually um what is the best way for people to get a hold of you uh, on social media or websites or any other way? Yeah. So social media and website. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat um, as Lilia Tarawai. So first name, last name. Um, and then my website is www.liliatarawa.com. First name, last name, nice and easy. Mm-hmm. And my email is lilia at liliatarawa.com. So nice. if you know my name, you should easily be able to find me on all social platforms, Twitter as well, and um, on the internet too. Nice. The joys of having a unique name that you can <laughs> yeah. easily dot .com yourself. <laughs> yeah. So... Just the final question, uh, Lilia. Um, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Oh, that to me, that just means being alive and letting yourself experience whatever you're experiencing in the moment. Like, if you want to laugh, laugh loud. And if you want to cry, sob your eyes out. And if you're angry, say, I'm angry. <laughs> like, to me, it's just feeling. It's letting yourself live and be the person that you are. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you. So, so just briefly, Lilia, thank you for that. Um, we are super grateful for your time today. Uh, you know, we, we, your story is truly moving and just to see you smiling and so, um, you know, so open and uh, stylish and whatever you ever else. <laughs> it's, it's really amazing to see how far you've come from, from those days. And, Um, I think people can learn so much from a situation like yours. It's just that many people feel suppressed in different ways or have Mm -hmm. um, tough childhoods in different ways, but you can still come through. And the the, the common ground is that that you can um, find ways of educating yourself or connecting with the right people. And um, and so thank you for sharing that message. I'm I'm sure it's going to help a lot of people. And, And thank you for creating a course for creatives because I think sometimes it's tough for really creative people in a sort of a corporate world. And I think um, that's going to really help a lot of people to make some money but and, and, and enjoy what they're doing. And I think uh, we need more people like that. So thanks for your time today from, from our side. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And, and just briefly for me, like Craig summed it up really, really well, but it was just like, so inspiring listening to you speak. Uh, it's almost like 
you, you, like you said, you just, that was a part of your life. You accepted it for what it was. It wasn't the greatest, but it also taught you a lot of lessons. Um, and it's going to continue teaching you lessons as you, as you, you know, carry on your life. Um, but you, you just took off from there and you've just like blossomed, um, into this just amazing charismatic woman who has this fantastic way of telling a story and no doubt has a, a fantastic way of writing too. And I, I actually really, um, I'm going to read your book. Like it's uh, like, you know, just through the way you tell a story, I can imagine it's, it's really kind of a riveting read and yeah, just, just thanks for being so open about it and telling us, you know, something that is rather, I guess, unique. Um, and it's, it's been a very powerful chat for me personally and, uh, the message yeah. that you have and the message that you're sharing, uh, will definitely help a lot of people, uh, not just within this podcast, but geez, for the next 50, hundred years and, uh, just, uh, yeah, very thankful for it. And, and we just wish you all the best and, um, hopefully one day we, you know, we, we maybe get to meet you in person and, um, yeah, that'll be, that'll be an added bonus. Yeah. So appreciate on it. A, on a dance floor in Ibiza. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. yeah so, um, no, really cool. We really appreciate it. Really fantastic chat. Oh, thanks Gareth. And thank you, Craig. I really love, love being on your podcast. Um, it's really nice to be able to tell my story in my own words. Because often people already have a story they want to tell when they yeah. come to talk to me. So thanks for letting me, thanks for letting me share. Perfect. Our absolute pleasure. Yeah, pleasure. Great. Yeah. Great chat. Cool. Thank you. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, 